it's nice to see you all on the Haskell Meetup. We have uh, an extraordinary meetup today. Andreas will show us how to uh, code a game live in Netwire. It's all functional reactive programming, so I can tell that it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff for all of us. And uh, for those that want to join us for the mentorship session, I would recommend that you come uh, one week from now, on the 1st of August. Uh, there is a mentorship session for uh, young Haskellers or any kind of Haskellers in Hackerspace. So if you feel that like intermediate, but you still want tutoring, I'm sure that uh, me and my colleagues will be very happy to tell you everything you want about Haskell and hopefully start your projects. And if you already have projects in Haskell, then please, please contact us and tell about these projects here, if you may. So, Andres? Cool. Uh, yeah, so um, first, does, who here knows about functional reactive programming? Okay. Who's heard about it? Okay, cool. Who's heard about arrows and control at arrow? Okay, it's the same crowd. So hopefully this won't be too confusing. Uh, it's probably going to be a little bit fast-paced, but it's also going to be quite interactive. So let's see how it goes. So functional reactive programming is basically, basically, it's a way where we write our programs where we actually incorporate time explicitly. Um, it also allows us to write our programs in a very declarative style. And what that means is that we can actually focus really much more on what we want the computer to do for us instead of how we want the computer to actually do it. So think of saying move instead of x equals x plus 1. Um, superficially, we can compare, we can think about the reactive parts almost like the observer pattern, in, if you're familiar with objective oriented programming, where um, an example of that is if you have an Excel spreadsheet and you have a cell that says this cell is equal to this cell and this cell. Um, if you change one of those cells that this cell depends on, it will actually react to that change and update its own value. <coughs> uh, formal, more formally, uh, we're modeling behaviors, and we say that behavior is actually something that's continuous over time, and at discrete points in time, there will be events. And we can react to those events, and what function vector programming is, is we set up a network or a system of behaviors and how they react to each other. Uh, I'm going to be using this uh, this library called Netwire. It's by this this guy. However, you say that. Um, his package is on Hackage. Uh, we will be modeling modeling behaviors using his data type Wire, and that comes from when we talk about function vector programming. We say that either we say behaviors or some call it signals, and a signal is transmitted on a wire. So. And we have a network of behaviors, so network. And event is the end. Um, this data type is a very fundamental part of this library, and it instantiates a bunch of interesting type classes. Uh, most interestingly, is arrow, because this allows us to leverage the syntax and the functions of the controlled arrow library. Further, beyond um, uh, behaviors and events, we can also say that the behavior can actually produce or inhibit. And this is a switching mechanism within this framework where uh, once a wire stops producing, we can say it's inactive or inhibiting, and we can actually decide to use a, a different behavior. It will become more clear soon. So every wire we have is an arrow. An arrow is kind of like a monad. I think like every monad is an arrow, but not every arrow is a monad. And it's basically a way for us to say the basic model of arrows is that we simply wrap our functions f, and it creates an arrow that simply takes an input and it gives an output. Very basic abstraction. Um, so that's the basic model and also how we wrap it, kind of like return. Uh, we can compose arrows, so if we have an arrow f from b to c and an arrow g from c to d, we can compose it to make a new arrow that goes from b to d. Very basic, kind of like function composition. Um, we won't go into detail about this, but basically we can also do partial application. And this is kind of interesting because it allows us to, to keep and remember the input to our functions. So imagine that we want to say 
we want to apply B to F to get a C, but we also want to remember the B value that I actually put in there. It's very difficult to do, but with this sort of partial application, if we apply the same value to both inputs, we'll actually remember what we gave F. Um, you, can, you can read more about arrows, it's very interesting. Uh, so the, the basic functions is that what we'll see most is R, which simply lifts a function into R. And we have some other helper functions as well to, to operate. This is the composition, this is the partial application. And this AND we will see as well in the code, which is basically if you have an arrow from B to C and an arrow from B to D, we can get a new arrow that goes from B and gives us both the outputs. It's very convenient. Uh, Netwire provides us with a bunch of default behaviors that we can, that we can leverage. And uh, most interestingly, we actually have like a function called time, which is just, as you might imagine, it's a, it's a value that is strictly increasing over time. And I guess I should say as well that wires are uh, locally stateful, so that's why we can have uh, values accumulating in, in wires. So time will simply output, goes from A to T, much like an arrow from A to B, this, this wire goes from, takes A's and it gives us T's, where T here is the time. Um, we can have wires called for, and this wire, this function, uh, given a value t, which is a time, amount of time, it will give us an identity wire that reads a's and gives a's, so identity, and it will only produce for t, t seconds, then it will inhibit, and if we then so like, we can choose to switch to a different behavior. Um, this is, <coughs> is, is t a free? Yeah, so this is a bit simplified in terms of type uh, signatures. So yeah, it's a, it's time, whatever that means to you. Um, we can also lift uh, normal functions. So this is with this we wire consumes numbers and outputs uh, the number double um, continuously over time. So it's not you don't apply it; it's just continuous behavior. Uh, we have events, and and the way it works is event is. Imagine it, it, an event exists for such a short amount of time that we cannot observe the value of an event. So if we want to actually read the, the output or the value of an event, we have to hold it over time. So given an event A, this whole function will continuously output the value of the last seen event. Kind of like a step function. If you imagine something, uh, event 0 and then later event 1, it will make a step to the new value. So. Uh, similar, uh, conversely, if we have a continuous value and we want to create events from it, we actually have to sample it. Uh, so, for example, we can use a function periodic, which will sample the continuous input A every t seconds and wrap it in an event for us. And examples of this that we'll see uh, is this standard noise function, which simply takes a period t, an interval, a, a random seed, or a seed number for the generator, and it gives us a wire that does not depend on input, but gives us a random number every t seconds. Questions? Cool. Oh, so yeah. I, I would I'd like to ask, what is the event type? Is it just maybe, or? The event type? Yes. What is uh, it It's actually no event or event. Okay. The data event equals no event or event A. This is the switching mechanism. So this is a type that should be wire A to A. But given two wires of the same type, it will produce a wire of the same type. So with the way we read this, is it will, this wire combined will behave as A until A inhibits, in which time this arrow will behave as B. And if B eventually inhibits, the entire wire will inhibit. So we will use this to build this very stupid little game. Um, just to give an overview of what Apple I have in mind, is simply this random level that's being generated, like a cave structure. The player is uh, traversing at the same velocity as the camera, and gravity is pulling us down, it's accelerating us downwards, and if we press space, we will be going upwards, for as long as we hold space. So, is this big enough for people to see? So I've cheated a little bit. It's kind of from scratch. 
<laughs> uh, we have a bunch of imports that I don't want to go through live. We have our parameters that you saw in the screenshot or the diagram I showed you. So we have a screen width, screen height, and some scroll speed. Um, this is the game. This is what we need to produce for our for our renderer. So to actually put something on the screen, it's a very simple tuple that I've put here. And by the way, I should caveat everything. This is not like best practice how you should do Haskell. This is how you cram as much as possible into 45 minutes. So, so don't take advice on how to like structure your data types from this. It's purely a type synonym for uh, including the player position, um, the x coordinate of the camera, and two lists of rectangles that we're going to use to represent uh, the ceiling and the floor of the cave. Um, I have a type synonym that gives us a wire prime from A to B that actually hides a bunch of <laughs> stuff that you have to know if you want to use NetWire. But for the purpose of this tutorial, it's not necessary. Uh, but you can see we have stuff like past time, monad, fractional monoid, blah, blah, blah. Maybe the most interesting is that this is the part where we actually explicitly talk about time in our program. So S is stated there? S is, is, S is a, st a session. So that's actually how it works. We're actually generating session and session deltas. And then we then step through the wire to actually produce, to get the, actually get the output. And this um, this uh, void here is the value with which we inhibit. So you can actually inhibit with some information, but for this tutorial, we'll just inhibit with uh, void. Uh, so this is the wire we need to produce. We need to have a wire that reads SDL events, and SDL is SDL event is a system event. It's different from just event. So SDL event is something coming from the system. So the wire reads the system events and it just gives us a game tuple. I then have some, some stuff like loading assets from disk, setting up the main function, main loop. But you can see this is just, uh, uh, yeah, it's just going through, this calling this game function every every iteration of the main loop. And we have some rendering stuff. Um, sorry, can, can you give the main? So, so the, I don't so know the like, iteration, what, what exactly does that? It doesn't really matter because it's kind of tied to to SDL and the specifics of that. So what's what's important to note is this function is being called every iteration of the main loop, and that's what we need to supply. So, so you get an SDL event for every buffer swap. Or I mean, if you so the way you would do this in C programming is a while, and you, you wait for an event from the system, and once you get the event, you feed it into to your like move player function, for example. And you somehow synthesize events in like. If I don't press any button, right, you still want to refresh the screen, obviously. Yes. So can can you can, can you even the? I really don't want to get into. It. I mean, the rest is going to be just 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 combination of errors, right? But. Okay. So what is your question specifically? Um, I, I think what what I want to know at least is is you do get events for 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 every frame, right? If SDL says please render the next frame, you get an SDL event that's called render. No, I still. I think it will just send no event. Like if you don't get any event, it will just. Um, but shouldn't it then be event of SDL? I really don't know how SDL works. It doesn't really matter for the purpose of the tutorial. It's an implementation detail. You can use any rendering library you want, and or any way to pull events from the system. I don't think it's important for the tutorial. Oh, so you mean that you you need to wrap this wire with some loop that actually renders these frames? It's not yeah. SDL that gives you the event. No, it's, it's not SDL. It's just SDL just takes care of the rendering. It gets events from the system. It says no event, event, some key press, whatever. You just have to react to it. Uh, the looping will happen regardless, even if there's no event. So to get an understanding of uh, what we have, I'm going to use this uh, procedure E. So this is similar to do syntax for monads, but it's for arrows. So we can just define some constants. Let's say we have a play position as a vector. Um, we return this value. That's a tuple that we need. So if you see an average is okay, that means it compiles. 
So we can actually run this. And you'll see what we start with. So this is it. We just have a stupid helicopter that I drew, uh, and nothing happens. And then the internal state is like, okay, so when you run like one, when you crank it for one frame's worth of, of evaluating your network, uh, so do you get back something which so that, like you really, get the, really that doesn't matter. So the way we think about it is something is continuous over time. We don't really want to think about looping or No, no, I'm talking about the outside view. Yeah, I understand that inside we will have this nice FRP thing that mm -hmm. is you know, your basic FRP setup. But I'm just asking, when you, when you run this for one frame, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, well, the next mean? time you want to run it, you want, you, know, you want it to have the updated state from the previous frame, right? So do you get back it's an implementation. What does it even mean to have one frame in a continuous but I mean in, environment? But in your main function, right? You are doing it in some sense frame by frame. Like, you don't have to be defensive about this. That's not what I'm, I'm asking. Not. I'm asking because I, I, I think it's a very interesting the, the bit where the interfacing with the outside world happens. Right? Uh, so can we just look at the main loop? Yeah, exactly. Because I think it, it will explain it. Okay. So when you render, when, when the rendering happens, is it only when the event happens, or is it happening just because... No, so, so, every, so this is the main loop, this go function is the main loop. And it has a set of assets, it has a, a reference to the screen, it has a session, and it has a wire. Right, so, and then you get like an update. So the first, thing we, the first thing we do in the loop, we, we pull the system, has there been an event? And this can be either no event, key press, whatever, screen update, screen resize, any kind of event. We step the session, so this is the old uh, frame, and we get a, a, the session delta and a new session. We then step the wire, and this W is going to be gain with the, the session delta, and we actually have to uh, tell the wire that we have an event. So this is the E event. And then we parse the output, and if it's inhibiting, if the game is inhibiting, we'll get um, the inhibit value left. So we quit, otherwise we have uh, the game tuple, in which case we, we render it, we flip the screen, and we, and we look around with the new uh, session and the next step of the wire. And step session is also something provided by Netwire? Or? The only thing here is Netwire is these two functions. Uh -huh. And the, the DS is the time delta? Um, it's, it's a session delta, but in this case it's time. And then I guess the answer to my question is that you get back this W prime, which you then pass to the next iteration. So Netwire gives you the updated network, which has yeah, a, in its yeah, you're internal right. state. It's, it's, it's correct. I, it's really beside the point. I think the, the purpose of this is we want to assume continuous time, but of course it's not continuous. This is what happens. And it keeps track of the time between you, when you call these two dots with the session delta. It knows it's like, oh, it's been, let's say, a function that integrates as a, and a continuous input value, so it integrates time, for example. I want to think about this then, like, and it knows, okay, this, it was called at time equals one, and then it was called again at time equals four, and it can do the sum for it. So we render as many frames as we can, basically, and this, yeah, the there's no frame that, 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 this, that wire function. Yeah, it will, it will know, it will know the, the time difference between the two frames, and then it can calculate all the values that it needs to do that. Okay. So, a good start, I think, is to start with a scroll, because it, uh, and this is basically, we want this to be a wire that doesn't take an input, so we just put an A, and it gives us a timeout. And we effectively just want this to scroll as fast as the, the camera scroll. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't compiled, but we need to say, yes. Do you normally have to be explicit, or can you just generate it from what the the content here? Are these uh, types inferable by compiler? Uh, usually not. You often have most of the time you have to give it. So this is a function that simply takes time each other of time, so one, two, three, four, five seconds, however long it's been, and multiplies it by scroll speed to give us the camera's x position. Uh, we can then Say camera position 
is equal to scroll, and we just give it some dummy input because it's not being used anyways. And now we are actually scrolling, leaving everything behind. Uh, oh shit, I forgot my notes. Uh, will you please excuse me for like one second? <laughs> I'll write back, I promise. Do we get some more Haskell? <laughs> <laughs> I've run out of Haskell. Let's remove the main group, yeah? Now we can read the main. Okay. Actually, it's not, it's not that complex when you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, maybe if, if we had the signature for step session and step five, we actually did it. <laughs> I just scrolled to the main loop. <laughs> Anything to worry about. Are we done with the main loop? <laughs> I love it. Uh, I think it's indicative. When I gave this talk in Berlin, nobody gave a shit about the main loop, but it's good that people are asking questions. We want to understand how we would write this ourselves, right? There's no point in just using... Yeah, the, yeah, um, yeah, I know. It's, it's good, it's good. My point is that it's very like implementation specific to SDL. You yeah, can use whatever. What do you do with your <sighs> so, so, yeah, Maybe so... We'll do it on the next tutorial. Yeah, we can do the main loop on the next tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> So to, to generate the world, we want to basically have a wire that generates uh, lists of rectangles. Because if you remember, we have this, this is the requirement, right? This is the protocol. Uh, that means you disconnected some of the cables. Power. Uh, yes. We have power. We have power. It's too much main loop. Oh, we just changed my resolution. Oh, change the font. There's also some some characters cut off at the beginning. Yeah, I saw. Oh, yeah, the resolution may need to be added to the project. Because I think it resized itself. <laughs> so what do I do? Change resolution to 1200, I think. Yeah. Yeah, something like this. What are you doing? I think, uh, Possibly the only thing that we is safer. Just reset the editor. Can we do it? Yeah. Smaller. <laughs> Can we just move the window to the left? This is a cut off. Can we just, just make it a little bit smaller? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. And uh, the advantage is that the font is bigger. That's <laughs> perfect. So, wow. Well, uh, yeah, basically what we want um, a wire that simply gives us uh, uh, a list of rectangles, right? We think if we have this, we can actually start leveraging this function to generate both the ceiling and the floor of our uh, cave. So like we saw, we have this standard noise uh, generator that you can't see the top of, but it basically needs a period. It will need an interval. And um, what else do we need? A C. So let's put that in there. Let's take the uh, interval. So this function, this wire here, will actually generate events of doubles uh, at every one second interval. Uh, assuming that function, we probably want a wire that reads those events uh, and give us 
a rectangle amount. So we should be able to uh, simply apply the output of this to the rect wire. Uh, and the type of this line will be an event uh, rectangle. Uh -huh. Now, uh, Netware gives us this very nice function, FQME. So if you see the type signature at the bottom, this is uh, something that this gives us a wire that consumes event with values of type A and gives us events of values of type B, where B is an accumulator. So we give, us, give it the empty accumulator and how to append to the accumulator. So I'll write a small function about accumulus. I want to accumulate in at least so I would tell it how to put things in there. So, so at this point, this is now something that gives us uh, an event of a list of rectangles. And if I compile it, you'll see it says OK. So it's to keep <coughs> growing at one. Yeah, it will, it will be a memory leak. But for the purpose of this tutorial, it doesn't matter. So you uh, just add a rectangle. We just, random we just rectangle. add. No, we add rectangles to the, to the beginning of the list. Uh, how this being done will be shown here. But this will be an ever increasing list of rectangles. But in order to get from an event to an actual event list of rect to an actual yeah. list of rect, we have to hold this value, and that allows us to do this. Now how to create a rectangle from just one double. Uh, so this double here is going to be the, the random height of the, of the rectangle. Uh, we know that we know, also know the x coordinate where we want the rectangle to be put because we know where the camera is from this scroll wire we have. So effectively we need two more. We need a function that is able to take this double and the scroll double and then from those two create a rectangle. So that's something we need, right? So again, we can use the arrow syntax. So it takes a double, uh, event of double, and we have this two right, so we can actually get that function by saying, and applying that to scroll, and we also want the rectangle to start at the right end of the screen. So we add the width of the screen to that. And then, so this function takes a, a double and gives a rect, so we want this to be event double to event rect, so we fmap uh, do the application like that. And now all we need to do here is capture a function here as well. Oops. As such, probably somebody needs so we can now just give screen width is also a wire? No, it's just an, uh, so every wire is a number as well. Uh, I mean, it, then you need to lift it somehow? No, because wire actually instantiates num. Okay. So we can say scroll plus this number because it's a fraction. Um, so we can now define our game world uh, as a wire that doesn't really take any input that gives us our rectangles. Um, shit. Well, this is a new keyboard if you want to. Uh, like I can say the world is the ceiling and the floor where we can now we can simply use this uh, rects function, we we'll give it an interval. And we have to give it a function how to create the rectangles. And uh, uh, we have to write this make way. Actually, no, that's not. Let's. No, let's. let's.
we hit uh, the x coordinate, we know for the ceiling the y coordinate will be zero. Uh, we had the, since we're sampling every uh, one second, the width of the rectangle needs to be screen width, and we'll give it the height. And for the floor, we can actually, instead of using the height for the height, we can sheet a little bit and use it for the y coordinate. And simply set a fixed height. So the rectangle will draw below the screen, but that doesn't show up when we actually render this. So instead of saying k, we can say k. What that looks like then. It's not actually. So there will be some glitching here because of some rounding errors, I presume. But and since we're using the same uh, random number generator for both the ceiling and the floor, they will actually be symmetrical. In <laughs> but I hope you can imagine that this can be done a lot more sophisticated. But we now have a world. But what is doing the scrolling? Because you, know, you keep prepending these rectangles, so you have an ever growing list of rectangles as they are, you know, the x coordinate just keeps growing. Mm -hmm. And new rectangles just keep being created? Yeah, but they, they keep creating with larger and larger x values. Yeah, so it comes from here, scroll. It's this yeah, but that's, that's why it's more and more to the right. But where is the actual scrolling? I mean, the, the fact that it's more and more to the Oh, it's in the it's not done with the render. So this this will output a tuple where the the middle value of the tuple over time will just be strictly increasing, and then the render just picks that up and, and puts it on the screen. Uh, and really now the only thing left to do is to position the player, uh, and we know for the player position it most likely it's going to depend on the input because we know we will have control over. Uh, our vertical coordinate. So we'll say this wire is going to depend on system events. And it will give us a vector, a position vector. The thing with position is we can actually get the position by integrating our velocity. So by giving it a base, a starting position, maybe like 200, 200. If we integrate velocity, that will actually give us our position. Similar this depends on this double. Uh, and just for the sake of demonstration, we'll start with hard coding uh, a constant uh, velocity, uh, of which is equal to the camera scroll speed, and we say zero uh, vertical velocity. And now the helicopter should be well, no, it won't, <laughs> because. Jesus. And now we actually have to give the, the system an end. And now the player is tagging along with the camera. However, we want the player to fall. It's too easy. So how do we fall? Well, all we know is we know that we have some acceleration downwards, so we actually want to integrate the, the acceleration. Uh, so given uh, a starting velocity. Uh, actually, I'm going to have some downward velocity beginning. Then we want to integrate the, the gravity vector, which is zero in horizontal axis. And let's just put 800 pixels per second per second as the falling acceleration. And if we run that, it's not going to work. We will now be falling at a strictly ah. increasing speed. <laughs> 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 yeah. So to, to sort of combat this, this falling effect that we have, we will actually be reading some, some input from the, from, the, from the system. So we want something that says space press. Uh, actually, I'll call it space, space down. 
And this is actually do. Yeah, and this is actually a case where, for some unknown reason, I have to use the. I think. Let's try this. Two. So, that's where it actually gives us this function became. Um, and if you look at it, became, it takes a predicate. Well, I can't click. It takes a predicate A to bool. And it consumes continuously input A. And if ever an A that it reads matches this predicate, so the predicate is true, it will wrap that value in an event. So this is very convenient for us if we, we want to generate events from a key press. Um, and what happens is it just passes through the value. So that's why we have STL event and STL event here. Even though we don't really care about the value in the wire output, with this became function just sort of passes it through for us. Um, so we take the event, and if the event so happens to be a key down event, and the key sim happens to be space. In that case, we'll say true, otherwise, we'll say false. And I'll do some copy paste programming. Similar look for up. So now we have two wires that generates events to us in case we press or release the space bar. So we want to use this here somewhere. And as we might use, we actually want to use uh, the switching mechanism here to switch between different behaviors. So we'll call this fall. So we want to fall until we press space. And then we want to go up until uh, the release space. And then we want to loop around. And this is actually quite easy. So press uh, space. This until function takes a tuple where it reads continuous input A. And as soon as this event B happens, this, this wire will inhibit. But as before that happens, it will just pass through this value A. So we can simply say press space is a dummy value that we'll never look at. And, and space down. Similarly. And for the sake of speed, we will simply have a constant upward acceleration. But we'll still have to keep up the camera. Zero, zero is at the top left corner, so we need to, if we want to go up, we need to have negative y velocity. So, our velocity, our position is integrating our velocity, and our velocity is basically falling until we press space, and then we go up until we release space, and then we just loop around. Let's say if we press the space, we actually start going up. But we have no collision. <laughs> it's actually quite easy to add. Uh, so the final function that says given a point actually, and a rectangle, take the bool, uh, I think I actually have. simply reads our position, our role, and gives us a book. 
to lift it into a variable using the R. Uh, and we have the position and the two lists. And if any of L or R contains the point or play, We can check for collision by feeding this player and the kid. So when so what happens here is we check for a predicate. So this thing will produce as long as the predicate holds true. So as long as collision is false. This will actually be producing, which means we will move on in in this sort of uh, in the code. Whereas if this one inhibits, the entire game will inhibit, which will in turn in the main loop uh, create this this left value in terms of in which we will under which we will equip. So at this point, if we now collide, we will quit the game. Um, yeah. Um, that's kind of it. I have like a little addition if you're interested. Otherwise, uh, I'm happy to hand over to Sanka. But I, I would still very happily uh, see the addition since Sanka is not ready at the moment, I think. Cool. Let's just do it. It's pretty fast. So I think I'll have to. Yeah, that's fine. So, let's assume we want to have some particle effects. Uh, so let's say we just want to have smoke puffs showing up after the helicopter. And you can imagine like adding how do I do more particle effects, whatever, but let's now have a smoke puff. And all that needs is a, is a position. Uh, we'll add. A list of smoke puffs Sorry. to our game state. Uh, One of the parts, and then magically, I actually have some memory code for that. So we didn't actually change anything in the game so far. Yes, we added this empty list of kind of particles that we want to have, and it's just empty list now. So, so if we want to have a wire that says smoke puffs, uh, uh, and this one will actually have to read the position of the player, and out will be a list of particles. So this is this, this is an addition. This I'm actually, I have a sheet function here. It's called manage wires. Think, yeah. So this is not provided by the library, but it, what it does is basically it maintains upon it maintains a collection of wires so instead of maintaining a collection of values. It actually maintains a collection of wires, and it gives you uh, the output of those wires. And as soon as any wire in this collection of wires inhibits, it will get removed from the collection. Uh, that's it. So we know we're getting the double from, from the player position. And we can use this wire to create uh, at that position. So this is a wire that creates this continuous smoke puff. Given the player position, we just produce smoke puffs. But we actually want this to happen at discrete points in time. Uh, so we have to sample it with a period. So I think 0 0.09 was a good level for that. Hmm. So what will happen now? 
It's nothing. That's all it is. So we'll feed a uh, smoke to, and we have to give the play position. And now we should see the smoke box. But they last a little bit too long. So we can actually, in this uh, place, we can say uh, for 0 0.5 seconds, show us more. So instead of the wire lasting forever, now it's a, it will inhibit, this wire will inhibit after 0.5 seconds and will get removed from the collection. Was it the type of this four combinator? Mm. So this 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 is as an identity function. So for 0.5 seconds, it will let this wire through, and then this entire wire will actually inhibit after 0.5 seconds. And when it inhibits, managed wire will remove it from the collection. Okay, so you, you, okay, so it's, it's not just an Arrow, but is it some kind of arrow apply? Does it work? Uh, well, okay, that, that's a huge type signature. <laughs> it won't show. Uh, so th th does that work? Does that mean that wire is not just an arrow, but also an arrow apply? It's also applicative and a bunch of stuff. No, not applicative. No. Arrow apply, right? Appli of course, it's applicative. It's I think I think it is because you have the, the, the reason I, I, I'm asking is because you have here a function which given a value returns a wire, right? And then you leave that, like, can, can, can you give it to the code there? Oh, sure. So, so you, know, you have this lambda which maps a value to an arrow, mm -hmm. right? And then so this you leave a, that with R into, a, it, so this it means a, it's a wire which goes from the player position to a wire of R. So this is, this is, this is a wire that is producing a wire. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I'm sampling the, the wire that's producing wires to generate an event wire. And then this function will exit we actually step that wire. So manage wires is horrendous. It's like uh, like import control unsafe event. <laughs> <laughs> so it does a, it does a bunch of stuff in the background, but But okay, but, but Okay, so, so is, wire, like is wire an instance of error apply? Yeah, I don't know. I was trying to check. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, no. Which is why you need to do this unsafe stuff instead of just... I do not know. So the code is over a year old, so I don't remember. Maybe it was the checking. Yeah, but I mean, but you see why this is all about arrow apply, right? No. Ah, because you have an arrow which produces an arrow, and you want to leave that. I mean, you, you want to squash that into an arrow of the thing, which is exactly what arrow apply gives you, and which is, is it which is exactly where arrow stats? and monad meet. That's why this is an interesting. So maybe that's Honestly, why you want to manage arrows is not there. So it, yeah, yeah. it takes this particular one and maintains a collection of arrows. That are live. So what it does it, it, it maintains a list of wires, and then it steps each of those wires, and either just keeps it in the list or removes it. And that actually looks like the magic. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is. I don't know. I'm just using this library. I'm not. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe that would be interesting to look into. Uh, if you feel like it. I don't know. Uh, so yes, that's it. I find it fascinating that you, you, you add actually so little to the strings, like mm -hmm. inhibition. I think the only thing that I've seen compared to, to other reactive programming stuff is this inhibition and letting the objects kind of die. Yeah. <laughs> and it starts being so much easier to use. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the fact that you can write this is probably the most. 
I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happened here, but in terms of declarative style, like this is to me pretty amazing that you can write this. Um, and actually, I don't think you you would have any uh, memory leaks because for the case, for example, you just take the I think first ten or of yeah, most unfortunately, this ten this rectangles and you. When I was, so this is not like I have a different branch. This is like a slim down version for this purpose. I think the became became function actually has a memory leak in it when I was doing my profile. Oh. Uh, so, but that I think that's a netwire issue. I'm not sure though. But I, I guess you could left compose that with our const unit anyway. In which case, but that could have right because then nothing of the original stream remains except for the timestamp. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Dude, you're way ahead of me. Yeah, so that may be a strictness issue. It, it, it does provide a bunch of like, different like, uh, help with that. So that, that could, could be the case. Cool. Done.